Okay, so everyone, this is uh, Tom Watts. He's a, a veteran of the Communist Revolutionary Movement in America. And uh, I'm going to be interviewing him today. And I'm just going to ask him real quick. Uh, so what organization are you, are you part of, Tom? Are you part of the uh, United Panther Movement? Right. So what type of work does that organization do? Well, the, the United Panther Movement is led by the New African Black Panther Party prison chapter, uh, which was founded in 20, 2005. And uh, I've been, you know, like the, the elder advisor to the, the brothers, and uh, uh, the United Panther Movement also includes the White Panthers, uh, Brown Panthers, and Red Heart Warriors. Native okay. American. So uh, you communicate with uh, Kevin Rashid Johnson, correct? Right. Yeah. So he, uh, what, what did, what was he in prison for again? Well, basically, he shot a cop in the ass. <laughs> yeah. That's uh. So he he admits to shooting the cop, or? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's different from uh, Mumia's case where he, he still maintains that he didn't shoot the cop or whatever, but... Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter either way. And once you get accused of shooting a cop and you're black, that's just kind of, you know, you automatically guilty. Well, the cop had earlier shot him in the ass, so he <laughs> decided uh, he needed to experience it himself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously that carries some pretty uh, heavy charges here. Especially, yeah. I mean, you know, if you shoot a regular person, you might you might get away, you know, and cops might even like you. But if, if you shoot a cop, I mean, that's, you know, that's a big fucking issue for them. So, oh, no, I, actually, I was going to ask you, um, didn't you say that the, uh, the United Panther Movement was doing something with the IWW in terms of uh, prison organizing or something like that? Yeah, we we're working with the IWW on uh, building a group called the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. Which oh, uh, awesome. organized a national prisoner uh, strike last year, and uh, you know it's a growing thing in, in several state uh, prison systems. Right, and you say that they their plan is basically to unite with like all of the different uh, nationalities within prison, and not just be sectarian. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's been the line that we've taken out, you know, over the last 10 years has been, uh, you know, black, brown, red, yellow, white, press people must unite, you know? Right, and, in, I mean, in prison especially, white people probably hold some racist views, but they're always willing to unite against the system which incarcerates them regardless. Well, that's the goal, is, is to get them to see that... Uh, you know, you don't have to like uh, other prisoners, you know, or their ethnic background or whatever to see that it, unless people unite, there's going to be no uh, impact of struggle. Right. Uh, Didn't you say there, uh, there were a couple people that were uh, saying, I don't know, I guess you said like hateful or whatever, shit towards like white people or... Well, to join the, the Panthers, the uh, United uh, New African Black Panther Party prison chapter, uh, you have to, you know, walk the walk of the political line, which means you can't be, you know, running around calling the, the white people crackers. and uh, Right, and regardless of what someone's thought is about racism, whether it's prejudice plus power or whatever people think about it, Calling a white person a cracker is never going to be productive towards uh, unifying the struggle. <laughs> so, right, you know, we hold that all comrades are equal. Uh, you know, regardless of their ethnic background, that a panther is a panther, and uh, so, you know, people can work with us, but not necessarily join the the party itself. Uh, if they're not, you know, down with the whole thing, you know, we're talking about all the way revolution and beyond for the whole thing. Right. Um, and uh, going back to uh, 
I guess, uh, your history or whatever, I mean, you were part of the White Panther movement, right? So was that part of the Black Panther Party, or was that a whole different thing? Well, back then, we were inspired by the Black Panther Party, and we looked to them for leadership, but we were organizationally separate, uh, more so than, like, the White Panther Organization today is, is an arm of the New African Black Panther Party prison chapter. Uh, so they're under the democratic centralism of the um, New African Black Panther Party print chapter. Right. See, that's uh, there's quite a lot of different black nationalist movements in the U.S., I think. Because you're talking about the New African Black Panther Party, because I know there's a new Black Panther Party, and there's also a new African Communist Party, I think it's called, and there's also the uh, Black Riders who... I guess their their leader or whatever was accused of uh, sexual abuse or something, and then they kind of fell apart. I actually donated money to them. Well, no, they they, ha they haven't ago. fallen apart. They've gone national and international. I mean, uh, all the formations have been growing, particularly in the uh, the last uh, year. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that because uh, I heard I think it was 2015 or whatever their leader. Uh, I forget his name, but um, he was accused of some sort of sexual abuse or whatever, and then they, a bunch of people, well, I mean, these are mainly like identity politics leftists, but they, they stopped supporting them, in essence. Are you, are you familiar with what I'm talking about, or? Yeah, the, um, and we're talking about the liberal left, you know, basic, basically, at the same time that uh, uh, the FBI and uh, LAPD were uh, trying to put a, a General Taco in prison, uh, there were people that were ex-members of his organization making allegations and uh, trying to get other groups to not work with them and stuff. Yeah, and that's a very know, common tactic. Not, yeah, I mean, it, it fits too much into the Contel Pro. Plus, the guy yeah. who's... They have this tribunal... The guy who's the spokesman and, and main person on the tribunal is the father of the one of the people that's making allegations. So, you know, even in a bourgeois court, you'd get more impartiality <laughs> than with that kind of a kangaroo setup. Yikes. That's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess people's main concerns are that you know, potentially, well, not not even potentially. I mean, we, we know for a fact that in some cases, uh, in leftist organizations, both here and abroad, cases of sexual abuse have been ignored or, uh, you know, put to the side or whatever. And uh, I guess because of that, they just see every allegation of sexual abuse as being legitimate, as de facto being, you know, they, they take the side of the person who's accusing the person of rape rather than just look, trying to look at it objectively. When you're doing any kind of investigation, you really need to adopt the outlook of innocent until proven guilty. I mean, yeah. it, that's it. We could see where it was a problem too, like you know, under the dictatorship of the proletariat, where uh, tribunals, you know, particularly in the Soviet Union, <clears throat> took an attitude of, well, if you were accused, you must be guilty. Yeah, which goes right back to the French Revolution. Yeah, and, you know, innocent people get hurt. But worse than that, the law itself gets hurt. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, if they are accused, they're, I mean, they're basically fucked at that point, which is unfortunate. But, uh, I mean, there, there's some people that believe that, uh, you know they're willing to accept the fact that some innocent people may go to prison or whatever at, at or be executed even at, at the price of them make making sure that they get all of the reactionaries and you know kind of yeah. close them in but yeah and people get an attitude of well better than a dozen uh, innocent people get punished than one innocent than one guilty person goes free but the long-term, you know, overall effect of that is to, you know, destroy people's faith in justice and actually build the counter-revolution. 
All right. It, uh, it, it needs to be more nuanced than just you know accusing people of thought crimes, because you know even though it may perhaps have a good intention, the outcome is just very destructive. You know, I mean, you know, Mal Mal's line was, you know, first of all, you know, we want to cure the the sickness to save the patient. You know that our, our first priority should be trying to reclaim people because, uh, you know, what's the root of most crime and the root of counter-revolution is bourgeois ideology and bad socialization. Uh, yeah. So, you know, our, our goal in all of, uh, you know, our justice work should be driven by, uh, you know, how do we uh, reclaim people and, and make them part of the revolutionary uh, movement and you know working with prisoners like a lot of the prisoners we're working with are not innocent lambs some of them have done terrible things uh, you know and to make revolutionaries out of them we have to uh, you know change their ideology and change their motivation certainly certainly uh, I mean as far as sending the materials to prisoners do you feel like some of them may just be happy to be getting books, or do you feel like a lot of them do genuinely agree with the material that they're being sent? Well, I mean, given their class position and the oppression that they're living under, uh, most prisoners agree with most of what we say, not necessarily <laughs> all of what we say. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you're not going to get an argument by saying that cops are pigs. Uh, <laughs> You know, unless it's like you know some real reactionary, you know, white Nazi guy or something. That maybe in some random fucking uh, county jail, I guess you might. But in in actual prison, I I mean, I, I seriously doubt it. Yeah, there are people are taught day by day that you know there is no justice in the justice system. Uh, yeah. That it's a class-based system, and if you're poor, you're fucked. Exactly, and. I mean, I guess the whole argument against mass incarceration, uh, from our perspective, is you know it's not that these people haven't done certain things; it's it's that their sentences are just insane compared to what they actually did, and their representation was subpar most of the time. So, not not well, even necessarily the fault of the public defender, but you know even then, you know shit happens I mean you look at a crime I mean if a person you know say has uh, lost their job and uh, their family's about to be evicted or there's no money to put food on the table uh, they're gonna go out and do what they have to do to survive you know whether it's you know, selling their ass or <laughs> stealing groceries or you know I mean, that's very obviously an economic crime, you know, it's like the John Bell John who stole the loaf of bread, you know, and gets sentenced to life on the galleys, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's uh, I mean, I get a lot of letters from prisoners and, you know, have been for the last, you know, 20 years or so. And uh, some of the stories people have to tell are break your heart, you know. Guys yeah, that are seriously. in prison for shoplifting or uh, you know, a small amount of drugs, you know. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, or, I mean... Why yeah. do people do drugs, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the whole systemic you know, issue. Happy, there. satisfied people aren't likely to be shooting heroin in their veins. Capitalist uh, alienation at its finest. Right, it's the alienation of capitalism, it's uh, the pain of being oppressed, you know, and, and having no power over your life. Um, yeah. You know, so you got stealing, you got drug use, you know, both of those tie directly to, and then you get to violence. You know, a lot of people kill people, kill people because they can't get protection from the society. You know, yeah. you owe some drug dealer money and he's going to kill you. You can't exactly call the police to protect you, you know. No. Not that they would. No. You know. So you you might have to shoot the guy that's trying to kill you just to survive. Yeah, and, and 
you know, people just don't understand that for whatever reason. They just can't put themselves in the shoes of those people. Well, yeah, people say, well, you shouldn't have been involved with, de with drug dealing in the first place. Well, you know, there's, it's easy to say when you've got a job that, uh, you know, gives you the privilege not to have to do things like that. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, where, where do you think uh, the left in America should go, or what is, I guess, what is the real difference between uh, your generation of leftists and the current generation of leftists? Well, I mean, a lot of things have changed. I mean, from the, the 60s to today. Um, in, in, you know, in the 60s, on the surface, it appeared that socialism was, you know, gaining over capitalism. Like Mao said, the the east wind is prevailing over the west wind. Right. You know, and then Stalin died, and, you know, the Soviet Union turned revisionist, and, you know, the whole thing began to unravel like a ball of yarn, you know. Uh, but, you know, what really happened was, you know, imperialism, particularly U.S. imperialism, after World War II, uh, attained global hegemony. And the national liberation struggles were co-opted through neocolonialism. Uh, it was much easier to fight, you know, like French colonialism than their neocolonialism. Absolutely, uh, in the uh, comprador classes. So. Yeah, your and targets aren't as, as obvious and as... Uh, and in many cases, the neocolonial agents were people that had been, you know, personalities in the national liberation struggle. So that, that confuses people even more, you know, like Mandela... Uh, yeah, uh, that's a that's a big mess right there. Yeah, there's still people that think, oh, Mandela was a great man. He ended apartheid. Well, yeah. I mean, they just apartheid was just uh, uh, replaced with a, a neo-colonial system that uh, puts the capitalists more firmly in control. You know, under under apartheid, they had the weakness of um, you know, everybody's saying, wait a minute, that ain't right, you know, walking on the the white side of the street or uh, oh, white-only uh, hospitals and, you know, things like that are blatantly uh, racist and, uh, you know, discriminatory. Uh, but you put a black face up front and, you know, yeah. I mean, a lot of the reasons they gave up apartheid was because the multinational corporations were backing off from investing in South Africa. Now they got no reason not to invest. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing is, I guess, leftists of this generation, they, they recognize neocolonialism, but they don't view class contradiction as the primary... They don't even well. They don't even look at things in terms of primary contradictions, really. They they just talk about uh, quote unquote intersectionalism, but they they never really explain what it is or like how it relates to how you could materialize a concrete revolution. So yeah, it's it's a ploy that uh, you know makes equal things that are inherently unequal. Yeah. Uh, and raises secondary contradictions to the level of principal ones. But really, when you talk about the left, there's two left. There's the bourgeois left, the neoliberal left, and then there's the socialist, you know, proletarian left. And right now, the the neoliberal petty bourgeois left is very dominant, uh, particularly on the universities and uh, in the in the black movement. The petty black bourgeoisie is dominant over the black masses. I thought uh, Trump's election would radicalize a lot of people. I guess it radicalized some people, but they're still mostly just concerned with sideline issues. I mean, it's not like these issues of gay rights, trans rights, or whatever are, are relevant and uh, 
you know, we should just, you know, tell them to go fuck themselves. But at the same time, I mean, while they are important, they don't, I mean, these issues can really only be resolved within socialism. And if, if they can be resolved within capitalism, then you have to beg, I mean, that begs the question, like, how important are they really if they can be resolved within capitalism, you know what I mean? But, I mean, we'll see, well, I guess. Well, I mean, you know, Lenin said, you know, to be a, a, a socialist, you must first be a Democrat. So, yeah, we support all kinds of democratic demands, even under capitalism. Uh, and gay rights, you know, at, in, in, at this stage is really a, a, a bourgeois democratic issue. You know, they have the right to vote. Uh, can you be fired for being gay, or should you be allowed to be fired? Yeah. Should gay marriages be recognized? These are really bourgeois democratic issues. But the bourgeoisie can never completely consolidate its, its liberal democratic revolution because it gets in the way of profits. No, yeah. but it certainly is is more uh reform minded in, in you know in certain respects than um a lot of the left wants to actually acknowledge, you know. Yeah. I mean like the the gay rights movement was funded by, you know, corporate money. Um big business, you know, you had uh big businesses decide, you know, like when uh um North Carolina passes a law against transsexuals using the bathrooms Corporations decide that they're going to not build their factory in North Carolina, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to boycott North Carolina economically to put pressure on. Boycotts don't work, really. I mean, well, they do when the, within scale. the bourgeois world. They work. Yeah, I suppose. But I mean, how, I mean, has BDS really worked against Israel? I mean, a little bit, well, maybe, but not really. I mean, Israel. Israel is feeling the heat, but they're so committed to Zionism that you know they'll they'll you know sacrifice um, you know business for plus the U.S. subsidizes whatever they lose. You know, oh, yeah, true. they get they get so much money from the U.S. that they can afford to give people services that they don't have here. <laughs> That's, that's pretty fucked up. Yeah, it is pretty, you know, pretty ridiculous that people say, oh, America is the, the richest country in the world. Well, you wouldn't know it to live here, you know? No. Uh, if you were in, you know, nor, you know, Scandinavia or Holland or someplace, uh, you're going to get a lot better social services like health care and met, uh, maternity leaves right. and things like that that, uh, we don't have because, you know, we're giving Israel money to do those things. Right. So wh while we're on this topic, I guess I might as well ask, uh, so what is your opinion on third worldism? Well, again, it's it's the petty bourgeois left. It's, uh, the last thing in the world they want to see is the dictatorship of the proletariat here. You know, <laughs> they don't really... They'd much rather deal with the bourgeoisie than with, you know, uh, class-conscious workers. I think it's necessary, the... you know, to deal with the proletariat here. Otherwise, you know, I mean, you can do whatever Internet shit you want to do, but, it, I mean, you got to do some shit on the ground at least, you know. So. Well, I mean, the proletariat's goal is to eliminate all classes. And, you know... While socialism will tolerate a certain amount of bourgeois uh, freedom and bourgeois privilege, it's trying to restrict it and do away with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, the petty bourgeoisie gets more or can get more from the bourgeois. Right. You know, like right. upward mobility, the chance to become bourgeois themselves, you know, or at least upper petty bourgeois. Yeah, I mean, I just think that the role of the labor aristocracy, although it's real, it's, I think, over-exaggerated. Oh, definitely. I mean, look at that, the decline of union me membership. Yeah. You know, and a lot of it has to do 
with liberalism that, you know, uh, liberalism has gone through phases which are reflect the, the ideology of capitalist imperialism. In, in Lenin's day, it was classical liberal, liberalism. Uh, then uh, uh, became Cold War liberal, or became New Deal liberalism. You know, the Popular Front liberalism. And then after that, it was the Cold War. Uh, and in the Cold War, you know, Russian women got the right to vote. Well, now American women can have the right to vote. Uh, you know, Russian workers get health care. Well, now American workers can get health care because they were trying to compete and to eliminate the possibility of being overthrown by the workers here. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, we're making all this money off global exploitation. We can afford to, you know, pay a, an auto worker what they uh, they want, you know. Yeah, somewhat close to uh, the value of their labor. Not necessarily the same, but, you know, closer than before, I guess, the base level. Well, really, in auto, they pay them pretty much the, the, the value that they create and then make their profit off of financing the car sales. Yeah. <laughs> so GM and Ford are really in the finance business now. Yeah, true. You know, that's where their profits come from. And the union's pretty good at figuring out exactly how much, you know, value the, the workers are creating and demanding that in, in salary and benefits. Right. And, I mean, another problem is just the sheer amount of retail labor that exists in the first world is just... I, I mean, you, you don't really produce anything at a retail job. Like, I work at a retail job. But you don't you don't produce anything, so it's very hard to unionize because it, it you can't seize any means of production really, so it's yeah. it's just a difficult situation in general. But I mean I, I don't think in socialism we would have all of these retail distribution centers. We would probably have you know a couple per town. We wouldn't have a shitload of malls or whatever. You know maybe yeah. a, maybe one or two in a big city. Oh, big city. You know. Yeah, you'd you'd have. Uh, I mean, I can't say exactly how you're going to have distribution, but yeah. uh, distribution initially is going to be based on, you know, money. Mm -hmm. uh, the people will be, getting, you know, working for wages and then spending those wages on consumer goods. Yeah. Uh, but the goal is, in the higher stages of socialism, is to eliminate money altogether and people work because that's the, the way things, you know, function, and they receive according to their needs. And the masses determine what the needs of the masses are, you know. Yeah, and retail is basically just a vehicle for capitalists to uh, further fetishize the ever-living shit out of their products, so. Right. But you're still going to need people working in that capacity of, of course. You know, you want to get a, you know, somebody's got to put the goods on the shelf and, yeah. you know, help you find what you're looking for and, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. You know, I guess there will be something uh, similar, you know, a communist a Home Depot or, or something. But, uh, I mean, they, they, yeah. they had grocery stores and stuff in the Soviet Union, but it wasn't fetishized to the extent that it is today. There, you know. Well, I mean, in the later, after Khrushchev, uh, there was definitely a privileged class of, uh, you know, party and, and state bureaucrats that could shop at special stores that, um, you know, uh, specialized in imported goods from the West and, uh -huh. you know, luxury items like caviar and uh, champagne and stuff, you know, that fit their bourgeois lifestyle. Right. But, uh, you know, like in China, um, they had, you know, under Mao, you had, they had uh, uh, food coupons that, you know, if you, when you were a worker, you would be paid with uh, a book of food coupons that you could use 
you know, at a cafeteria or, mm-hmm. you know, lunch joint. Uh, but then they also had restaurants that operated on cash. If you want to take your best girl out for dinner and a movie, you could, you know, go blow some money on her, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, you can still pay a prostitute in labor vouchers. I guess that was <laughs> kind of a big issue. <laughs> I am sure there were hookers that would take food vouchers. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, on the whole... Um, you know, under Mao, food was cheaper, and it was easy to afford to have a healthy diet. Yeah, uh, more so than it is today in China. Right. Uh, what do you think about uh, like China's foreign policy under their Maoist era? Because I I think it's probably pretty significantly reactionary in a lot of ways. Well, it depends on what time period you're talking about. After the um, the Lin Piao affair, uh, Mao and the and the, the the Maoists completely lost control over foreign policy, and then Deng Xiaoping and his buddies were dictating foreign policy, mm-hmm. which a lot of people don't understand. I think, well, as long as Mao was alive, he had total power, and that's just not true. He was always uh, representing a minority against the majority. But his minority had him, yeah. you know, and because they had him, they had the the support of the masses of people. And So I even mean, though the bourgeois Vietnam, elements within the party could control the Central Committee, they couldn't, you know, function without being uh, bombarded from below. Yeah, I mean, they should have just killed uh, Deng, really, when they had the chance, but, I mean, they didn't have that kind of foresight, obviously, but that's... that's... Well, I, I think it, you know, I don't think Deng was ever without uh, enough support that you could... Like, even Lu Xiaoqi wasn't killed. Yeah. He died under house arrest. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Deng was his number two. Yeah, and perhaps that that's another another flaw in uh, not necessarily Marxist Leninist, but I, I mean I guess just uh, the way that Marxists look at these previous socialist states is that they look at it in terms of like, well, when Stalin died, when this happened, and it's like it is the period when this person died in chronologically, but the support behind like Russia had a lot of support from the peasants, and people don't necessarily know that. I mean, they don't know that he was an opportunist. People don't know that Yeltsin was an opportunist, and he had his own base of support. They just see that, yeah. like, oh, well, I mean, these these forms of uh, socialist government, they weren't so vulnerable that one person could just, you know, get up and just have a coup d'etat and then, bam, back to capitalism. I mean, it had to grow slowly for that to occur. Well, I, I mean, I think at every point, Stalin represented the majority of the party, and he had the votes of the majority. Yeah. Which anti-Stalinists don't want to admit. He was the Democratic leader. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were times when he leaned to the left to fight the right, and times when he leaned to the right to fight the left. Um, uh-huh. But at, at, at no time was he a minority. You know, which was the situation Mao was in from the Great Leap Forward on. He was a minority within the party and the government. Represented a minority view. Well, left comms would accuse Stalin of being a populist because of what you just uh, explained. Yeah, but that's because left comms have no concept of politics as the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. Um, Machiavellian style politics towards a goal. Yeah. You know, they have this idealist view that if you're the leader, you can make anything happen anytime you want, uh, which is ridiculous. You know, politics, you know, you know, malice even come straight out and say, if we don't have the support of the majority, then we shouldn't push it. You know, we should bow to the will of the majority and continue to work to win people over to what we think is correct. 
Yeah, without completely going over to Tailist. I, I guess Tailism is really what pop like actual populism is, which is you know, not a good thing most of the time. But, I mean, if the people want to go a certain way, you can't really change that. You can only get on their side and say, hey, okay, I'm with you, but, you know, try to slowly inject what you actually want into, you know, the mass line. I mean, yeah, take an issue like, like gay rights. All right, the party may be totally convinced that, um, you know, gay rights are legitimate, but they may not be able to convince the majority, you know, right. at, at a particular time. So you have to continue the struggle and continue to work to change public opinion, you know, and that's something that, like, identity politics cannot see, you know. Um it's like when uh, the issue of, of women voting, um, you know, was was a, a major issue in the, in the left. Um, there was also the issue of the freed slaves voting, or at least black men voting. Yeah. And there was more votes for letting black men vote than there was for letting white women vote. Mm-hmm. And so the, the feminist movement split. Uh, the mainstream of the movement said, well, if women can't vote, then we, we're not going to give the vote to blacks either. <laughs> and a minority that was more radical said, wait a minute, we have the votes now to get, uh, you know, an extension of suffrage to the former slaves, the men. <clears throat> so let's go with it and keep working on creating public opinion in favor of women's right to vote. That's really But important. those aren't those women aren't the ones that are, you know, get their pictures on stamps and stuff. No. <laughs> you know, we get like Susan B. Anthony who was one of the ones who said uh, you know, basically screw black men. We want our vote or nobody gets to, an extension on the suffrage. And it created you know, for a generation, there was a bitter divide between the left and right feminists over that. And I, I think, uh, after observing identity politics for a little while, I mean, not as long as you, obviously. You've seen it since the 60s, probably. I mean, the progenitors of identity politics. But I think uh, that basically you just need to extend an olive branch to them and say, hey, we're, we're in favor of what you want uh, completely. But the way that people are right now, they may not, you know, necessarily, it's not even necessarily possible to achieve that. But we, we want it as much as you do, but we don't, it's not achievable at this moment. And please don't, like, hate us for not being able to, you know, give that to you. But Well, I, I think we have to combat it as an ideological uh, blockage to the revolution. You know that uh, there was there was somebody on Facebook not long ago uh, that was saying that uh, uh, they were only going to be pro-communists as long as the communists are pro-trans rights, uh -huh. and that if they weren't pro-trans rights, then they'd be anti-communists. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know it just shows that you know they don't give it's a fuck about it. Very individualistic. Yeah, I mean, it's my issue is all I care about, you know, which is basically a bourgeois ideology of saying me is all I care about. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's like I knew people that were in the communist movement that were gay back before communist parties would allow their members to be openly gay. So the condition was you have to pretend you're straight in order to be a communist which is wrong but you know they, they understood it for what it was and they were a real fucking communist and I, I asked them you know why they felt you know were affiliated with this party if you know they had to hide the fact that they were uh, a gay person or at least keep it under wraps and they said uh, well you know I'm willing to you know if I wanted to you know, if I was a priest, I'd give up sex 
to promote, uh, you know, Catholic religion. Uh, I'm a communist, so I'm willing to give up sex to work as a communist. Yeah. You know, I'm just... And, it, you know, it's, it, it's a small sacrifice, really, when you think about it, you know, when people are sacrificing their lives. Yeah, certainly, certainly. You know... And it, it, I mean, it's just unfortunate that that shit has to be framed in that sort of uh, paradigm. But that's just the way that the masses are. The bourgeoisie will use any kind of division they can possibly grasp to throw at the proletariat to divide them in such a way. Yeah. So. I mean, it, you know, the people, you know, homosexuality has been around forever. But the identity of homosexual really only goes back to, like, the Victorian period and Freudianism and stuff. Mm -hmm. People used to look at, at homosexuality as an act rather than an identity. You know, one person may say, I prefer boys to girls. But, you know, there wasn't like, well, that makes you a homosexual, you know? Yeah, I guess with, it, if you were, like... That's your preference. But like I like chocolate better than vanilla. Yeah, the anti-trans thing is. I, mean, I guess saying that you would be an anti-communist if they weren't pro-trans. It's really just it goes back to democratic centralism, I guess you could say, because you're not you disagree with the party, but you're gonna break with the party instead of follow what they say. So I mean, I guess that's how, it, how it's supposed to work. But you're, I mean, you're not like following the party line because you individually disagree with it. So you're. Kind of well, I mean, part of democratic centralism is realizing that advanced positions are always held by a minority before they are held by the majority. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you've got a new idea, that doesn't mean that the majority is going to see it right away. But yeah. the party allows you to reserve your opinion and at appropriate times to bring up the issue again until there's a majority that agrees with you. And then the minority has to subordinate to the majority. Certainly. I mean, that's that's how real democracy should work. Yeah. So. It's like, uh, you know, when, when they were fighting in China, uh, they had, uh, you know, the Coleman Turn come in and say, well, we've had this experience in Europe and Russia, so we know better than you how to, uh, you know, run the revolution. Yeah. And, you know, it led to tremendous, you know, loss of party members and disasters, you know, with the urban uprisings, given the fact that there were so few proletarians, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, but it, you know, at a certain point, after a lot of, you know, people have been killed, the majority swung to Mao and said, no, we're not going to listen to the common turn. We're going to do it Mao's way. And uh, at first, you know, Stalin was like, who the fuck is Mao, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but then as they started being successful, then he said, well, all right, all right, I was wrong. Let's move ahead, you know? Right, right. And, I mean, so, do you view uh, armed, organized leftists as, as a key to success, or what, what is your opinion on the left being armed, I, I suppose? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the left should always be armed, you know. Uh, you know, right. to not have guns is, you know put you in a very weak position. So I guess I would extend the question further and say, uh, would you, are you in favor of uh, pro-gun legislation in a bourgeois, uh, you know, system? Or Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, we would, the left should, you know, not bow to the liberal uh thing about, you know, well, if we eliminate guns and we'll eliminate violence. No. Right. If we eliminate guns and only the police will have guns. 
Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's another problem with communists is they, uh, well, you know, these liberal communists masquerading as, you know, communists or whatever. But they say, like, because it's a predominantly right-wing position in America to be pro-gun, that must mean that you're right-wing because you're pro-gun. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a fallacy, really, but... Yeah, it's like, it's like, if you criticize identity politics, they say, well, that's what the right wing says. Well, sometimes the right wing is correct. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you know if, if the right wing says the, the moon is going to be full tonight, they may be completely accurate. You know? Definitely. Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't, we don't uh, disagree or agree with someone based on uh, what their identity is. Right. You know, it's like, you know, concrete analysis of concrete conditions is the essence of Marxism. And, uh, you know. So. And that's part of part of real politics, too, is, you know, a, a genuine communist party is going to shift its alliances on different issues. Oh, yeah. You know, there are times when you, you do agree with um, you know, a conservative group, and there's times when you don't agree with the liberals, you know. Accelerationism may make sense in a, in a certain context, but, uh, you know, it, you have to use it. I mean, the left just needs to be more Machiavellian, I think, you know, and they're too idealistic, they're too, uh, we need to be right about every position at every point in time, regardless of our goals, our long-term goals. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess speaking of which, I mean, I, I've seen many leftists, not only anarchists, but some Maoist communists also condemn Assad, and they're, they're obviously, I mean, this is uh, April 7th, the morning of April 7th, uh, Syria has been bombed by the United States Air Force, or, not, or Navy, I guess it was Tomahawk missiles or whatever, but... Yeah. So, well, I mean, our job is revolutionary defeatism. You know, it's like Lenin said, if Persia declares war on France, we support Persia. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter why, you know, it matter. you know, the, the reality is France is an imperialist power trying to dominate Persia. No, they would say you know, Syria is an imperialist power supported by Russia, a bigger imperialist power. You know, Russia is well, obviously it, imperialist, but Syria... Uh, I mean, Russia's imperialist, but compared to the U.S., uh, Russia is trying to, you know, maintain its buffer zone, mm -hmm. you know, which is getting thinner and thinner as NATO creeps to their border. Opposed U.S. hegemony. Yeah, the U.S. is definitely the aggressor. I mean, yeah. the U.S. has bases in, you know, like 500 countries or something, you know? Right. It's, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Why, why did they put you know, their, their bases so close to Russia? You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Why, why, if the Russians <laughs> are on peace, how come uh, they put their country so close to our bases? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt who the aggressor is in the world or, or who the hegemonic power is. There's only one superpower in the world, and it isn't Russia. <laughs> Russia has a lot of natural resources, but particularly in gas and oil. Uh, they have coal, they have iron, you know. But what they don't have is, you know, the export of capital to the degree the U.S. has. They don't have the export of goods the same as the U.S. has, you know. Oh, uh, speaking of which... Uh... You, could change, you, can, you can spend dollars pretty much anywhere in the world. You can't spend ruples anywhere in the world. That's a good. That's a really good point, actually. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, and, and it's not like Europe where, uh, you know, everybody's competing to change their money. Uh, you get a horrible rate when you try to change money in Middle America. Yeah. yeah. Same goes with yen, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean the dollar is. A global currency. 
which you know goes back to again who's the hegemonic power I don't know why I was uh, a, lot of, a lot of Americans are still blind to the fact that the US is not a nation anymore it's it's a global reaching empire oh yeah definitely definitely yeah, it's like Rome you know? extend as far as they can uh, you know not and I, I guess another another problem where you're trying to explain this shit to uh, liberals and such is they see imperialism as a it has to be a military action it can't be like a political economic concept it has to be you know the only time imperialism occurs is when someone puts boots on the ground in another country like you know they accuse yeah. uh, Russia of imperialism towards Ukraine but well they don't they don't even have boots on the ground in fucking Ukraine except for Crimea but I mean. yeah well Crimea is what they wanted yeah. when they had the coup in Ukraine it was to get the you know control over Crimea which is where the, the Soviet naval base is and where they could control the uh, you know the flow of the oil yeah uh, but when they were blocked on that, they started screaming, Russian aggression, Russian aggression. No, I mean, the situation in Ukraine is laughable. They're saying that uh, Russian tanks invaded Ukraine. I, if Russian troops invaded Ukraine, Ukraine would be devastated within, like, 48 hours. I mean, the Ukrainians, they can't even get, like, you know, <laughs> uniforms together. They don't even have uniforms. How the fuck are they going to go up against the fucking Russian military? I mean, it's just laughable. Yeah, if the Russian military rolled into Ukraine, then NATO would be across the border in hours, you know? Yeah, and, and you look at these, uh, these like, pro-Donbass YouTube channels, like Vox Popular Evo and shit. I mean, these soldiers are using World War II radios and World War II weaponry, these uh, DP, like, 28s and shit, these, like, World War II Soviet-era machine guns. And it's like, really? You think they're being funded by Russia? I don't think so. <laughs> I really, you know, uh, maybe I think a little a lot bit, of, but, you know. Not I think they're getting lot. a lot from Russians, but not necessarily from Putin. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely some there's some Russian volunteers there. There was Russian yeah. volunteers in Serbia during the Balkans Wars. So there's going to be Russian volunteers, you know, and yeah, there's going to be slobs, but. There's people that are, you know, donating, you know, Food, medical supplies, weaponry, right. Right. ammo, uh, and there's not much Putin could do to stop it if he want, even if he wanted to. No, but no. Putin does not want to have a, a direct confrontation with the West. No, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the reaction is going to be to uh, <clears throat> Trump's attack on the on the, the air base and. Syria, you know, I mean that's pretty much challenging Russia to fight them. I think they'll just sit there and watch, really. You know. Well, I, Putin has been pretty slick. Iran, maybe uh, not. I mean, Iran might intervene if they have balls. It depends, I guess. Yeah. But uh. Hezbollah. I mean, there's perhaps. definitely a. A, a lot of contradiction going on within the bourgeoisie right now. Um, like I posted today, uh, everybody's all upset about the attack on the air base. I said, posted, uh, thank God Obama's war is over. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Damn, dude. Now, now it's Trump's war. And the Democrats can oppose it. You know that's true, but uh, Hillary Clinton also uh, she was in favor of bombing those those air bases. So it, it's oh, like yeah. they, they switched overnight. These uh, these people who supported Hillary, the people who supported Trump, they switched overnight, and that now the alt right doesn't like Trump anymore because he bombed Assad. But it's like, what the fuck do you expect? I mean, maybe the alt right will be fucking communist now. <laughs> Who fuck knows? But. Well, I think he's backing off on uh, Banyan and those guys because uh, there's not much they can really give him except, um, you know, burned fingers. Mm -hmm. Trump's not an ideologue. He has no. opinions, but, you know, 
he's much more of an opportunist pragmatist so, you know that can switch positions when depending on what's going to get him you know but he doesn't you know that he had to back off on his uh trump care because he didn't have enough republican votes that was pathetic well, that was a lesson to him, you know. The man doesn't know much about real politics. No. Uh, he thinks he's a great deal maker, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours that goes on in, in politics. That if you want to get a bill passed, you got to be willing to give up some stuff. Right. Like Lincoln's emancipation or his uh, uh, support for ending slavery was conditioned on having to give a lot of a lot of other issues to get the votes. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, that's true. And they could have subjugated the South. Uh, the, their, their initial plan was to subjugate the South for quite a long time, but eventually they just kind of gave up on it. And one by one, those states oh, just kind of took power again. Yeah, once the uh, the capitalists had established domination over the South, they were much less interested in 40 acres and a mule. Yeah. And uh, they said, well, you know, we can, we can deal with these Southern uh, aristocrats as long as they're borrowing their money from us and not England. <laughs> as long as their cotton is going to New England and not Great Britain, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I have uh, another another question here, which is uh, someone recommended this to me actually. Um, so the question is, what is the most important thing leftists can only learn through experience? Uh, probably humility, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, New, a lot of new communists are extremely <laughs> arrogant, you know. Seriously. Uh, they think they're so smart now that they've read a couple of books um, and that they don't need to learn from the masses. But uh, really, you know, it's your relationship with the masses that teaches you how to be a communist, I, not I the book reading. Know. Yeah. They're uh they're very smug about everything. Yeah. But you look at them, you look them up on on their Facebook page, and you find out that like, you know, a year ago they were uh, Socialist Party of America, and now they're a Maoist. You know. Yeah, they're super. Their cool. politics haven't changed as much as their buzzwords. Or no, no one used to listen to them, but now that they became trans, they became super repressed, and now they... Uh, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> you know the whole trans thing is, is like, um, let's let's take a materialist point of view on this if we're going to be communists. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, the, the idea that people can be whatever gender they want to be uh, is, you know, pretty much pure idealism. Yeah. Um, well, they, they distinguish between sex and gender. They think gender is a social construct and sex is a, a biological reality. Most of them, anyway. Most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's some merit to that argument. But they take it to such a degree where they, they're not even really trying to explain it in a materialist aspect and they're just, you know, vulgarizing this shit out of what they actually believe and they just turn people off who would try to understand what they're trying to say. And yeah. it just fucking goes to the fucking shit all the yeah, yeah, they fall back on I don't have to explain anything. Oh, I, I my... fucking love that, dude. It's like, yeah, I don't have to explain anything. It's your job. It's like, I, I thought you were a communist. <laughs> what, what is this shit? Yeah. You don't have to explain anything because you can't. <laughs> you know, you're just mouthing slogans. You don't know well, how to... Communists have to explain shit. That's part of the fucking deal. Yeah. No, I mean, we, you know, we have to deal with people who are idealists, you know, because we have to deal with non-communists. Mm -hmm. And it's like somebody may believe that they're a child of God, but we still have to deal with them in the course of the class struggle. Yeah. You know, 
that doesn't mean that we have to agree with them that they're a child of God. You know? <laughs> yeah. As much as I can, I'll try to accommodate them and, um, you know, treat them respectfully, but... Absolutely. You know, at the same time, I'm going to be promoting materialism and dialectics. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly a, against the oppression of Muslims, uh, 100%, but at the same time, while not supporting the oppression of Muslims, I also think it's stupid that, like, you feel the need to uh, get on your knees five times a day or, or wear a certain piece of uh, headgear to uh, because you think that a celestial deity is compelling you to do so. I think that's pretty uh, absurd in a lot of ways. I mean, maybe that'll piss a yeah. lot of people off, but I mean, <laughs> I just... Yeah, I think people get all upset about Shari law. Shari law only applies to Muslims, and only when they want it to. Yeah. You know, like, in, in the Soviet Union, in the parts of the Soviet Union that were... or whatever. Uh, yeah, that were Islamic, they could go to Shari law to decide an issue, like divorce or whatever, as long as both parties agree. You know, then instead of going to the state court, they go to the Shari court. But, yeah. you know, if they want to chop somebody's head off, you got to go to the state court for that, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't say, okay, uh, you know, you, you can throw gay people off the roof because your mullah said it's okay. Yeah, this is a pretty funny page that uh, conflates, like, uh, the Soviet Union with uh, Islam. It, it's called uh, Muslim Stalin. This is a page on Muslim Stalin. It's just, it, it's completely hilarious, but it's like, at the same time, I mean, they, they did give a lot of rights to uh, Muslims and shit, you know, more than, than we're probably ever going to give, be given to them during the <laughs> Russian um, Empire. So, you know, Right, yeah, the Russian like, Empire was committed... To the Orthodox Church, as the one That's true good. church. Yeah. But uh, I was su surprised a few made a couple May days ago to see a whole contingent of Orthodox priests carrying paintings, you know, like iconic iconic pictures of Stalin. And really, you know, I'm like Ma American what the May Day. Hell? No, no, in Russia. Oh, yeah, I was like, <laughs> damn. <laughs> but but so you got to remember that R Stalin, during World War II, made a deal with the head of the Russian Orthodox Church that they could have their churches back, and, you know, because they had been banned because of, you know, their uh, alignment with the White Army, mm -hmm. uh, that they could go back into business on two conditions. One that they supported the war effort, and two, that they not organize any pogroms against the Jews. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, to them, like, Stalin was, you know, heaven sent. Right, yeah, and when speaking of, like, uh, that type of thing, I mean, I always see parallels to the French Revolution, you know, because in the French Revolution, all of the states of Europe declared war on uh, the revolutionary French government, and, and it's like in the Bolshevik re Revolution, in the uh, when the Bolsheviks first declared power, you know, all these nations fucking sent troops to them to to crush the rebellion. But but in both instances, the revolutionary armies crushed their enemies instead because yeah. they were actually motivated by, you know, what they were fighting for instead. Yeah. And both made attempts to, to curb religion, but... It, and they, they gave concessions that, like... In the French Revolution, they gave concessions to recalcitrant... Well, actually, no. Recalcitrant were actually the bad the bad priests. But they were like, well, you, you can have your church as long as you don't... Basically, you don't talk shit about the revolutionary government. And, you know, Right. That, that's a reasonable concession, I think. Yeah, I mean, religion... The, it's bullshit. Like, a lot of things cannot be simply wrote, written off with the stroke of a pen. Yeah. It, it takes, you know, maybe generations to win people away from it. You know, like, uh, mm -hmm. 
Edgar Snow was visiting in uh, Mongolia, and he had Chinese translators with him, you know, who could translate from Mongolian to English for him, yeah? Yeah. And uh, so they wanted to take him to see uh, a museum that was formerly an Orthodox church. And while they're touring the museum, there's old people going in and worshiping in this old church. And Edgar Snow made some comment like, that's unusual. And the, the interpreter whispers to them, they don't know it's a museum. They think it's a church still. You know? <laughs> Jeez. You know, I mean, they, their attitude was, you know, they're elders. You know, we're not going to insult our elders, but, you know, we're not raising our kids to believe in this stuff. I mean, I'm in favor of liberation theology. Whatever tools you can use to get towards the uh, goal of communism, I'm in favor of. But at the same time, I mean, I am an atheist, and I also think that it's, you know, it's it's completely illogical to raise people on these uh, convictions, but, you know, as a concession, you know, perhaps, okay, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I have a son that... Uh... He is, you know, suffers from a uh, um, form of schizophrenia and stuff. Uh -huh. And lately he's gotten into religion, even though he was not raised with it or anything. And, you uh -huh. know, I'm, I haven't said anything negative about it because, you know, if he feels that that's helping him with his right. struggle with, you know, mental health and, you know, but at the same time, I know I still promote the idea of, you got to deal with disease from a materialist perspective, you know. You know, you got to figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't here, you know. You know, should you pray for the good guys or the bad guys? Well, I don't think you should pray at all. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if you want to pray for the good guys, all right. You know, it's up to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're going off to battle and some elder comes up and sprinkles you with holy water and says, go get the white army. We'll pray for you. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you don't smack the holy water out of their hand. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you know, revolution is not like something that, you know, like the anarchists think, you know, you have revolution day and then after that, uh, class struggle is over. Yeah. Uh, you know, class struggle actually intensifies under socialism. It gets more uh, intense. Certainly. But eventually you reach the point where uh, classes are, are disappearing and the need for a state fades away. And that's when you put down the gun and, you know, it's like Mal wrote an essay about, you know, talking about how now that they have state power. It's not necessary to put people up against the wall and shoot them. You know, now we can put prisons, you know. <laughs> and they can, they can, can reform, watch. you know. It's possible. Yeah, we can, just, we can just watch them, you know. <laughs> yeah, we know they're, they're counter-revolutionaries, but that doesn't mean they have to be locked up as long as they're not, you know, actually spying for the U.S. or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask two more questions. The, the first question I'm going to ask is, uh, okay, so basically there's, there's been a lot of controversy in, in the left regarding the uh, the YPG, the uh, the Kurdish uh, women or whatever. What do you see as the role of the Kurds in uh, the Middle East right now? Because I, I essentially see them as like they're oppressed, but they're you know they're they're under the thumb of the U.S. regardless of that fact. Well, I wouldn't say they're under the thumb of the U.S., but uh, particularly in, in northern Iraq, they have control of the oil fields and they're selling their oil to the West. Then they're using money from selling the oil to equip the fighters, you know, inside Turkey and. Which is you know, good. Iran. I think that's good. Well, m maybe not in Iran, but in, in Turkey, yeah. I mean, we, we support the right of nations to self determination even though we're in a period when nations don't 
really exist as independent states anymore. Um, yeah. yeah. So I support the Kurds, but, you know, sometimes critically. My issue is, like, anyone who has airstrikes done for them by the U.S. and is trained by U.S. Special Forces, probably not the best people to be. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I understand that the Kurds are oppressed, certainly. They, they're being oppressed, you know. They've been treated like shit, you know, throughout history by Arabs, by Iranians, by, by whoever, by the, by the Turks. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean that whatever they do is correct. You know, regardless. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not like we can, um, you know, try to micromanage their struggle. Yeah. As, as, you know, uh, I mean, the main enemies that we are opposing are Israel, the U.S., Turkey, Saudi Arabia, yeah. uh, and so forth, you know. How do you think that the Kurds will react to this uh, bombing of Syria? Because I think that, you know, they'll probably just... I mean, they might even be in favor of it, but they might just... They'll probably just sit around. They're not going to really give a fuck about Syria being bombed. You know, they don't give a shit about Syria at all. They don't give a shit about anti-imperialism. They only give a shit about their national liberation struggle. <laughs> well, so. the nationalists, that's true. But even the nationalists, have they have had a working arrangement with um, the Syrian government for a while now mm -hmm. and that they're they're pretty much allowed to control their autonomous regions you know and then their allies in the fight against ISIS and Al Qaeda and so forth yeah I mean I would definitely qualify the Kurds as a press I just would not personally go and we, we've seen a lot of leftists go and volunteer for uh Rojava, uh, the Kurds, the yeah. YPG, and such. I, I don't think I would do that just because their their uh, relations with the U.S. are very very dubious. Uh, if I was going to be a communist and go and volunteer somewhere, I would not go and volunteer somewhere where I was going to be personally trained by U.S. special forces in a contra like fashion. You know what I mean? I, I just wouldn't wouldn't do that at all. But but that's. I mean, part of what the U.S. strategy is, is to unleash Cluster chaos. Cluster you know? yeah. Um, you know, like in the prisons, you know, we have to deal with connections between the, the white, you know, nationalist prisoners and the guards and try to win the, the white races to side with the other prisoners and not the guards. I, yeah... Uh... Well, I mean, w when I was in jail, I mean, I associated with some white, uh, I guess you could say racist or whatever, but they didn't identify as racist. They hung out with Mexicans or whatever, but they were confined to their own, like, they would have their own table, they would have their own race or whatever. And they, they would do that, and, like, I was part of that because I'm white and what have you, but I, I truly believe to this day that they weren't actually racist, that they were just... That was just the way things were, and that, that's how it had to go in prison. And yeah. people, well, people we, who we, haven't been to prison don't recognize that. So. Right, yeah. Well, we found when we organized the um, um, the White Panther organization in, in the prisons, yep. that initially uh, the white racists wanted to fight us, and there were some confrontations. But that's, you know, there hasn't been an incident like that in several years now uh, they accept that we're not you know like going to challenge them for control of drug sales or things like that um, and that it is better when all the prisoners are working together but oh, when they attacked course. when they attacked one of our organizers every gang even some of the white gangs uh, wanted to you know wipe out the the brotherhood and our guys had to say no that's that's not the enemy you know yeah uh it's like this is a contradiction among the people and we have to you know it's like if they attack us we'll fight you know but well, yeah from what i researched the, the brotherhood is kind of like a mafia type 
uh, organization or what. But a lot of people that identify with it are just kind of, uh, they're not actually part of it. They're just kind of like, well, I'm white and I'm in jail and that's, you know, I'm, I'm Aaron yeah. and fucking Brotherhood now, I guess. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, if, like, there is a White Panther group, then you can be white and not have to affiliate with them and they'll leave you alone. Yeah. So that's a better option for a lot of people. Yeah, it, it's it's hard not to get involved in that sort of uh, gang dynamic when you're locked up. It, I mean, it kind of forces you, especially yeah. if you're in general population. You just you just kind of have to for fucking protection. Do you want to get your fucking ass beat or do you want to fucking join a gang? It's like you know, fucking pick. One well, that's bit. yeah. I mean, that's. Like, the, the Panthers are in a position now where pretty much every gang respects us. That's awesome. You know? That's and, uh, awesome. you know, the, the, a lot of the, the OGs have, like, the complete works of Mao now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking and, dope. Uh, That's awesome. You know, if you want to rise in the organization, uh, you better start reading, because... Yeah, you need to be. You know, you know it, it's it's regarded as uh, liberating truth. You know, right. But uh, I mean, it's a frequent trick that the, the guards try to pull is they'll throw a panther, like a black panther, in with a uh, white supremacist or a white panther in with black nationalists, figuring that they're going to get their eaten alive. You know. Uh huh. Then they're amazed to find out that it swings the other way, you know. <laughs> that now the black That's nationalists cool. are moving towards pantherism, or the white nationalists, uh, instead of beating up the black panther, are, are identifying with the white panther movement, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, Rashid has written about that, you know, about how, you know, in we would not be able to, to do this if we didn't one-on-one -on -one try to educate white racists. Very important. Very you know? Important. Uh, because they will throw us in together, and, uh, you know, we have to go in with an attitude of, uh, no, that's not correct. You know, let me explain it to you, you know? Yeah. This is how it works. Blah, 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 you know? And even if they don't immediately agree, they at least respect the fact that you patiently listen to them and ex try to explain to them why they were wrong. Absolutely. You know? It's all about respect in prison, especially. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there was a gang in Texas uh, called the Dirty White Boys. Uh -huh. And they used to fight with the, the Klan and the Nazis. And... So they got a hold of some of our literature, and we started corresponding. And uh, the one guy wrote to me and said, we always fought against the Klan and the, the, the Nazis because we're sharecropper boys. <laughs> and the sharecroppers were always persecuted by the Klan. And our fathers fought against Hitler. So, you know, we knew we, there was, you know, something really fucked up with these yeah. Uh, movements, but we were until we met you guys. We couldn't articulate how we were different. You know, we didn't. We knew there was a difference. We could feel it in our guts, but now we can articulate it. Uh huh. And then, you know, some months went by, or a year, or whatever. And a young guy in the dirty white boys in Texas, they tend to put gangs together in a pod. You know as a way of segregating the prison. You know? Right, yeah, and I'm familiar with that, yeah. So they threw a, a guy that was in the, uh, the, the Crips, I guess it was, uh -huh. uh, into the pod with uh, Dirty White Boys, and this young guy beat the crap out of the, the Crip and put him in the hospital. But instead of that, you know, giving him creds, the other guys, like, you know, shook their head and go, that was the wrong thing to do, man. And they said, well, can you explain it to me? What did I, what did I do wrong? 
and they gave him my address. And they said, write to Tom, and he'll explain wow. it to you better. That's awesome. That's fucking so, cool. What did you say to him? Well, you know, I mean, I explained to him about, you know, you know, I wrote several long letters, you know, my famous 10-page letters. You know. And then he wrote back to me and said that uh, <clears throat> he sent a kite to the guy in the hospital and made a self-criticism uh, for what he had done to him. And wow, that's... he said the guy wrote back to him and said, uh, you know, I, I was sitting here thinking about what I'm going to do to you, and and I realized that that would be a complete waste of time. Yeah, and, uh, and a kite, then, for those who don't know, is like a prison uh, contraband note or whatever, like a letter. Yeah, you get somebody to who's mopping the floors to pass it along, you know. To, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, so they hadn't, you know, as of the last letter I got, they hadn't met, but through corresponding, you know, to each other, you know, the the white, uh, the black guy said, you know, I realize, you know, why you did what you did, and, and I understand that, you know, you've learned better, and that's an inspiration for me, you know. Wow. You know, little victories like that, you know, People don't see where we're having this big impact on the prisoners, but in the states where uh, you know we're active, uh, there's been a dramatic change from racial riots to organized strikes and hunger strikes and things like that. Uh -huh. uh, not that we're like you know leading in any kind of hegemonic way, but our our line is having impact on the masses. And it, it matters what we do as communists, how we right. how we talk, how we act. And also, our our position is not that we're going in there to to be the organizers, you know, or to fight for to make a better prison system. Our job is to transform the slave pens of oppression into schools of liberation. So you know, we're trying to avoid an economist way of looking at things and, and take the high road of ideological and political education. Probably pretty difficult in a world where uh, people will do anything just to get some commissary. <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, I remember in California when they had the hunger strike. Uh huh. The first day of the hunger strike, they served um, strawberry shortcake <laughs> on the trays. Uh huh. And only, you know, a few dozen people turned in their trays. Right. And the organizers were like, oh, fuck. You know, we, we've got our neck stuck out now. We've had all these press releases and stuff. But the next meal, like a thousand people turned in their trays. Wow. It was that they said, you know, man, I never had strawberry shortcake before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, I couldn't pass it up, but mm -hmm. I just started, you know, with the next meal. Wow. Yeah, I mean, a lot of prisoners have never had, I mean, the things that they've never had. I remember I was, one guy came out, and uh, he'd been in for 15 years. I was uh, going to an event down in Virginia with him, and I said, uh, well, let's stop. You know, we're in Maryland. Let's stop and get some seafood. And he goes, uh the only seafood I've ever had is tuna fish sandwiches. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know. Wow, dude, that's great. Yeah, I remember so, uh, when I was locked up this summer, uh, we were uh, we were given chocolate milk for the Fourth of July. Yeah, how how patriotic, you know, so being in jail for the Fourth of July or whatever. But I mean, uh, you know, kind of a fucked up and ironic at the same time. But there, someone was like. Hey, uh, can I have your uh, can I have your chocolate milk? And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, that chocolate milk that, that's crazy or whatever. It's like you know, chocolate milk just in, in prison is just it's a fucking uh, it's, it's like a bar of gold. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I'll trade you a carton of cigarette for your chocolate milk. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this crazy. guy had never had any kind of seafood, so I ordered a uh, one of the big samper plates and. Uh, 
I said, just try it. You know, this is this, this is that, this is the other, you know. Yeah. And then we ended up ordering two more sample plates, you know. Uh-huh. He was, you know, delighted with, uh, you know, tasting food that he knew. But, you know, these guys that have been in a long time, when they come out, it's, they, you know, they have a lot of problems just, just making their mind up about things. Like, I've seen guys sit and look at a menu for 20 minutes. And go, what do you want? He goes, I want it all, you know. I, mean, <laughs> I can't decide. You know, I never had a menu in my hand before. Yeah. You know, you ate what was on your tray. Right. Where one guy, uh, he he w- called me up. He wanted me to help him pick out a pair of work boots. And then I found he'd had other people go to the store with him to look at the work boots. <laughs> and, you know, it's like a big decision, you know, because... He hadn't bought clothes in his adult life, you know, let alone trying to true. figure out what was the best for his money. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. So uh, institutionalized, you know. I guess uh, I'll leave with one last question, which is going to be uh, so. A lot of people talk about the Black Nation. What is your opinion on national liberation in the U.S. and uh, the Black Nation as it is? Well, it's a little complicated. Black people were formed into a nation, you know, and then as recognized by the Coleman turn. But even as they were being recognized in the 1920s, the conditions for nationhood were disappearing in that people were moving away from the Black Belt South and becoming proletarians. You know, it's like Stalin said, the national question is essentially a peasant question. Right. And peasants are disappearing. They've disappeared in the U.S. They're disappearing all over the world. Yeah. So, that, you know, that situation has changed dramatically. I think, you know, from here to go back to, uh, to overthrow empire and go back to nations would be a backward step. The, so, what we need to do is go forward to form, you know, a, a revolutionary intercommunal uh, society that can then transform into communism. So I think we want to move away from nationalism altogether. And I Yeah, I completely agree, actually. I used to be in favor of the black nation, but when you really think about it, it's like, you know... I mean, average black people, they don't want this, like, crazy-ass conception of, like, an entirely new nation with their new laws and shit. They just want to live in the same society. They just want to... They don't want to be treated like shit. (laughs) I mean, that's basically it, you know? And not only that, I think, you know, in a revolutionary intercommunal (laughs) revolution, you know, black and brown people are going to be in strong positions. They're not going to be the bottom layer anymore, you know? No. Um, you know, so, uh, in fact, white people are, you know, I had a guy, uh, I went out to Ohio one time uh, with one of the, the, the brothers from the um, Red Heart Warrior Society. Uh-huh. Uh, he was like part Mohawk, part Italian. Uh-huh. And he was a biker, Hell's Angel affiliate. And he wanted to introduce me to the um, president of his bike club. And he said, you know, whatever you do, though, don't talk anything about black people or revolution with this guy because he's a real redneck. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're you know talking, we're smoking a bone and stuff. Uh-huh. And... Uh, he and I are, like, feeling each other out. You know how you do that politically? You say something a little more radical and a little yeah, more radical. Yeah, than yeah. yeah, all the time at my work, yep. <laughs> and uh, so at a certain point he said to me, uh, he put on some music for my friend. He said, I want you to listen to this. And he said, Tom, come on with me. I want to show you my, where I work on my bikes. You know, you know, a garage with a you know a workshop in it. Uh-huh. So he lit up another bone, and he said, well, I want to talk to you about some stuff here. He said, but well, I don't want you to mention anything to Mike, because Mike's a real fucking redneck. But mm-hmm. I think there's going to be a revolution in this country, 
And I think we have to accept that the niggers are going to have to lead it. Wow. And I laughed, and he said, what are you laughing at? I said, because Mike said the same thing about you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughed, you know. And he took a picture out of his wallet, of a, you know, it was a picture of a black kid, you know, baby. And he said, what do you think about this? He's a cute kid. He said, that's my grandson. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, first I wanted to break my daughter's neck. But, I, you know, I love that kid so much. And when I think that some cop may call him a nigger, you know, and, and disrespect him, my blood boils. Wow. That's powerful. Even though he still uses the term nigger himself. Right. And, you know, that's where, where you know, like this whole, you know, correct, political correct speech breaks down is that people don't primarily change over language. No. They change over ideal, ideas and feelings. And then that, you know, the language okay. comes along later. Yeah. And it, I think a lot of leftists alienate, you know, working people by their you know, acting as uh, language police. It's unfortunate the way it is. I mean, you know, they don't want to... I see their good intentions, but they're, the way that it, it impacts people concretely is negative. So. I remember back in the Panther days when we started, you know, we, Huey made a decision that we should work with the gays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we follow in the party line. And I'm riding in a car with, you know, like four or five gay guys. And, uh, we were talking about, you know, I guess it was Nixon, and I called him a cocksucker. And then as soon as I said it, I, I blushed, you know, like, oh, fuck, you know. <laughs> oh, fuck. And, and they, they giggled and they said, that's okay, we, we call him a cocksucker, too. <laughs> wow. But, you know, I mean, I think people that are real, you know, if, if, if you know, you're oppressed in some way, you know, you're used to the uh, expressions and stuff that are common in language. You know, it's not like a big deal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I can remember going being at powwows, uh, and I don't know how many times I've seen white liberals correct Indians that they couldn't use the word Indian, <laughs> that they're supposed to say Native Americans. <laughs> and a lot of oh, a lot Christ, of, there you go. a lot of Native people don't like the expression Native American. No, it's a it's a new colonialist. Uh, you know, they prefer American Indian. I mean, you know. Yeah, right. As, as opposed, to, like the American Indian movement. Yeah. Uh, you know, did not identify themselves as Native Americans. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it's like saying. Uh, you can't say Negro. You have to say Afro American. Or, or you know, after that, it, it became uh, black people, which I think black people is mostly you know popularized. But then it became people of color, and it's just these, this liberal band aid type mentality that just keeps continuing itself. It, it, it'll become something new in another seven or ten years or something. But but it, it won't fix the overall problem of racism <laughs> at all. No, and the problem isn't residing with the masses problem is you know what serves the ruling class yeah and uh you know a lot of people get upset with Mao's statement that only the ruling class you know uh <laughs> exploits the, the black masses and uh they're like oh no that's not true the rednecks are the worst you know rednecks may can you really you know have someone out of a shack yeah, they're not really exploiting black people. They may not like black people, or they may not want their kids to play with them or something, but that's not the essence of, you know, what's keeping racism alive. Absolutely. They could form good alliances. Like, back in the day, we had a group called um, the Young Patriot Party, which were hillbillies. Um uh, now, oh right, yeah, yeah, 
and then uh, I think uh, Caleb Maupin was trying to create, recreate them, and then he was criticized heavily for it, but it was actually a good fucking idea. <laughs> well, even back then, you know, a lot of the Black Panthers, there were a number of Black Panthers that quit when they made an alliance. You know, the more nationalist ones. And, and uh, you know, uh, Fred Hamden said, well, you know, good, get the fuck out because... You guys are going to hold back progress. Yeah, and, uh, he was you know, such a young age. when you talk to him, you know, I, I met them, you know, because, you know, they were part of the, the Rainbow Coalition we had. And they'd say to you, you know, I, I used to be a racist until I became uh, aligned with the Black Panther Party and I understood that racism serves the capitalist, you know, exploiting class. But, you know, they still have family that's in the clan or whatever. <laughs> Damn, <You know>? dude. <laughs> that's fucking... That's raw. That's fucking crazy. But, you know, that's, that's fucking... Uh, that's, that's the way shit works. That's capitalism for you. That's organizing. That's fucking communism. <laughs> uh, Dialectic, one, dialectical materialism, really. And one, one of the guys I knew was from the Chicago group. And... Uh, he said the way he saw it coming about was that uh, they had this one bar right in the middle of, uh, you know, the hillbilly neighborhood, the hillbilly ghetto. And it was like the baddest bar in, you know, that part of town, you know, where the tough guys hung out. Uh-huh. And uh, he said that uh, Fred Hampton walked in with a, you know, a carload of Black Panthers with him. And as soon as he walked into the bar, you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> you know, everybody just turned and looked. You know, the jukebox went off, you know, and everybody's like, you know, what the fuck is it? No white man, had, no black man had ever walked into that bar before. And so the bartender said, uh, you know, uh, what are you doing here? Fred Hampton said, I'm here to organize the niggers. <laughs> and they, people looked around at each other and said, uh, no niggers come in here. And he said, well, what are you talking about? He said, don't they, don't they treat you like a nigger? Don't they work you like a nigger? Don't they make you live in nigger housing? You know, don't the cops beat on you and, you know. Wow. And... They said, he got that right. <laughs> Damn. I mean, that's that's fucking crazy, dude. If you want to say anything closing to the people who are going to be listening, uh, that's up to you. That's your opportunity right now. Well, I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, we're, we're moving into our, the first, you know, 11 years of the, the new African Black Panther Party prison chapter uh, has been concentrated almost completely inside the prisons. Now we have a situation where the chairman, uh, Shaka Zulu, uh, is going to be coming out in a few weeks from a uh, halfway house and is going to be uh, initiating organizing in the community. And uh, so people that want to hook up with the um, United Panther movement should, you know, get in touch and and just, you know, begin where you are. You know, I mean, everything starts with, you know, two guys or two women, you know, and then you build from there. Um, mm-hmm. It's like we're not we're not focusing on the colleges. We're going to be focusing on the, the oppressed neighborhoods, and uh, we're going to start a thing called the uh, Books and Breakfast Program, uh, which is going to combine, you know, breakfast for children and for homeless people and stuff with getting people into study groups and getting books into the prisons and uh, we're not we're not going to build on the, the you know the neoliberal left we're going to build a proletarian left and uh, we welcome all working class people from you know whatever ethnic group awesome okay so, I mean, I guess that concludes the interview. Uh, do you want to plug in something where people can contact you? 
Well, right now they they, they can on uh, on Facebook they can contact me uh, Tom Watts, um, or uh, they can contact uh, Kevin Rashid Johnson has a Facebook page now. Uh, he has a website. It's uh, Rashid M O D at uh, Yahoo dot Yahoo yeah Yahoo dot com. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll definitely put links in the uh, in the description of this video wherever it's posted. But okay, yeah, um, you could also contact me at uh, New England Anti Fascists if uh, you need to, uh, if, if you're having an issue or whatever, or if you just want to talk to me. Also, uh, that's uh, New England Anti Fascists, the page on uh, Facebook. So uh, this has definitely been an awesome, unique experience with Tom Watts of the United Panther Movement, and uh, this will conclude the interview. All right. Okay. Thank you very much.